Good evening. Hi, my name is Chelsea and I'm a bookseller here at Parnassus Books. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce David Arnold, author of The Electric Kingdom, which was the Parnassus Next uh, selection for February. Parnassus Next is a YA subscription box, and he was wonderful enough to sign a bunch of books for us. So if you want a signed copy of The Electric Kingdom, it is available at Parnassus, and there will be a link below in the comments to purchase that from us. If you have any questions for either David or Jeff, you can put those in the comments as well. So it is my honor to introduce two of our favorite YA authors, uh, David Arnold and Jeff Zintner. Hello, everybody. It is. Hello. Hey, hey. Uh, I, I don't know why I'm talking like we're on like a morning Zoom radio hour. Like, hey, it's it's hey, Jeff and the Fart Man. Aluga. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. Oh, I, I just why do I get silly when I see you? I just get I know. silly. We just like each other a lot, and I guess like that's people. it. I'm going to introduce you. Is that okay, David? Do it. Yes, okay. very formal. Let's do it. Everybody, it's my pleasure to introduce New York Times best-selling, critically acclaimed author and wonderful best friend of mine, David Arnold. He is the author of Mosquito Land, Kids of Appetite, The Strange Fascinations of Noah Hypnotic, and now The Electric Kingdom, his newest release. And uh, David, uh, you live up in Kentucky, you've had an ice storm, and your power's been out all day long. So really, it's more like the not electric kingdom. Hey-o! Hey <laughs> I actually sent you a text just before this asking you not to laugh or acknowledge that joke in any Oh, no, I didn't get it. Seconds. Uh, yeah, no. the plan was we would just sit there oh, stone no. faced. Dang, I just... I'm reading it now. Yeah. I'm gonna do the non-electric kingdom joke. When I do, just let like seven seconds pass. Can Don't we take another up. pass at let's it? Try it again. Let's, yeah, let's do try another it again. pass. At it. All right. Okay. okay. Hey, hey uh, David. So you uh, you're up in Kentucky. You had an ice storm, and uh, uh, you, your power went out. Uh, and so it, it's more like the the not electric kingdom. <clears throat> So, um, uh, you, uh, <laughs> it's like between two ferns, <laughs> so uncomfortable. <laughs> it's my favorite kind of humor, oh, uh, but, your, but your power's back on, you're good to go. Yes, yeah. Yeah. The premise of the joke actually wasn't a joke. Uh, around midnight last night, uh, we lost power and, um, yeah. And I, you know, we, we have a, an eight year old, almost nine year old who is a, he's a heavy sleeper as long as the sound machine is on. So the sound machine cut off and he was like, Ding! oh man. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was rough, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I can use I can use a sound machine as an alarm clock. I just set the sound machine to turn, turn off, off and yep. it's like a reverse alarm clock and it works Damn, as well as an know, alarm clock for me. I don't know how anybody sleeps in total silence. I can't do it. Yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. Uh, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, so then all morning, no power. And my wife and I are kind of looking at each other. And I, I told you earlier, it was like at one point we couldn't feel our feet and we were like, this isn't going to be good. <laughs> um, and then we were trying to figure out what we were going to do. And then, yeah, right around noon, it came back on. So, um, yeah, but we have an ice storm here right now. So if I freeze suddenly um, and my power goes out, then I'll just use data and FaceTime you and we can, we'll figure something out. So. Oh, no, Jeff, you froze. <laughs> Not like the protagonist of Electric Kingdom. Did I freeze? Yeah, you froze. You're you're freezing. You're coming in and out. Am oh, I? There you, you're back. You're back. Am I back? I thought you were, Am I good? Yeah, I thought you were. I thought you were kidding with me. You're doing another you're joke. Like... <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, we're, we're professional authors. We need to we need to straighten up. We that's straighten right. Up that's here. right. So, I, I, so before we before yeah, yeah, before we do anything, yeah. I do want to say thank you so much to Parnassus Books. Uh, Nash. I lived in Nashville for over a decade, and they were my home indie for that for that time and I love them dearly. And I remember going to events there and just being in awe of the way that they, I, to give, and Jeff, you you were there as well, but like 
um, you get some real street cred when you're like, I remember Parnassus books when it was literally half the size that it is now. True. Um, it was maybe even less than half the size that it is now. It was like um, a hallway. It felt like a hallway, but it was yeah. cozy and wonderful. I mean, so yeah. many great events and you're all tucked in there and then they bought like the store next to it and knocked down the wall. And now it's this amazing, uh, yeah. But uh, I love the store dearly. Um, and funny story, so Ann Patchett owns or is part owner of, of the store. And I had not uh, had the chance to meet her for a really long time and I'd always wanted to. And then one, one event I was at and she was there. And so I went up to her, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go introduce myself. And um, are you there? Yeah, my dog is driving me nuts. He's scratching at the door oh, and I'm gotcha. trying to get him to stop. <laughs> <laughs> you can bring your dogs in. Well, hang on, Do you keep, keep talking I'll to the crowd. Yeah, I'll keep, keep, keep telling the, the story. story. I'm gonna grab the dog. Anyway, so uh, I, I go up to, to Ann Patch. I'm a little bit nervous. I'm like, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm David Arnold. I'm an author. I do, I do all of my launches here. But what Ann Patchett heard was, I do all of my laundry here. And so then um, when I, we eventually like ironed it out. Um, <laughs> but then when she signed my copy of Commonwealth, it says uh, something like um, to your to your laundry or something. It was anyway, I, that's the joke. You're muted, you're muted. Okay, there we go. Man, what a, dis what a just a, just a train wreck. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just such a disaster tonight. I'm sitting here it's talking on you. No, I've got my dog. I'm like the bad Zoom guy. Well, now, this is, I, you have two dogs, right? I have two dogs. Yeah. And, and this Greg one is and Bowie. This one's Greg, Bowie. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's Bowie. Okay. Yeah, this one's Bowie. Hey, Bowie. What's up, Bowie? So, um, you have talked, Dave. So, let's get into the Electric Kingdom. Let's talk okay, to the let's Electric Kingdom. And uh, you have you have talked about having the idea for the Electric Kingdom since 2013. Now, this is a sore yes. subject for me because I don't like to think about how long we lived in Nashville, the same city together, and didn't know each other. And then we met literally like seven days before you moved back to Lexington. Yeah, it was like a week or maybe yeah. two, but no more than two weeks. Yeah, um, it's a very sore subject to me yeah. to think about you living in Nashville in 2013, me blithely going about my life, we just Same. not knowing each other. I didn't even start writing until early 2013. So there was no okay. way we could have known each other. But yeah, you, you have talked about 2013 being a significant date for you in, in relation to this book. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So um, I, was, I was a musician in Nashville, similar to you, Jeff. Um, I had a home studio in my attic and was content to just record record sort of work for hire music for the rest of my life. I thought that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And um, and then, yeah, my wife and I found out that we were going to have a baby. And uh, she had this great job with, um, you know, health insurance and benefits. And I was a freelance musician. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, it was decided pretty quickly that I was going to be a stay-at-home dad. And that's really when I got serious about writing. And so I was writing my first book, Mosquito Land, during that time. That was really my focus. That was um, the story that I felt like I had to tell. Again, assuming that, you know, nothing would ever come of it. No one would ever read it. Um, but it was sort of a desperation kind of creative Hail Mary. Um, and, uh, and just decided I was going to sink my all into being a good dad, a good husband, and I was going to write this novel. <laughs> Um, and it was, he was less than one year old. I mean, he was, we were, I, I remember where, exactly where I was in his nursery. He's, he's on the floor, little infant baby. And um, I had this image popped in my head of a, a boarded up farmhouse in the woods with a, and the farmhouse had a bell tower. And I had no idea <clears throat> um, what to do with that. I didn't know, well, first of all, why would a farmhouse have a bell tower? Like that made no sense at all. And I didn't know who lived there or why the place was boarded up or anything like that. So I kind of tucked it away in a file. Um, I've never been the kind of author who has many ideas at once. I usually have one, maybe two. And I kind of have to like, <clears throat> if, you know, if one of them is not really working, I kind of have to make it work because <laughs> I don't have a bunch of other things to go to. Um, in I'm this the case, exact though, same way, by the way. I don't know if we've discussed this, but I'm I, yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, this was an odd case though because this was it was that image uh wouldn't go away for the longest time and but I did but I had no idea what to do with it so I didn't even count it like when 
when people would like for my first three novels, whenever like we would talk about what are you, what else are you working on or what's coming down the line? Like I never included that because it was this weird idea that I had no idea what to do with. Um, and so it wasn't until 2017, um, late 2016, early 2017, when I first started thinking, okay, I think I really might turn my attention to this book. Um, and there are, there are a lot of reasons for that. I'm, one of them is that I'm a firm believer that story input uh, equal story output and the stories that I was starting to consume were heady sci-fi um, like speculative fiction um, you know post-apocalyptic literature that sort of thing and the more stories of those that I took in the more I was ready to kind of take a crack at creating one of those stories. So let uh, why don't we talk about some of those story inputs like what is in your kind of uh holy canon of post-apocalyptic literature because I'll tell you it's it's one of my favorites I absolutely love it I read everything worth reading uh yeah. within kind of the the genre whether it be YA whether it be adult literary fiction etc it's yeah. why I absolutely love the electric kingdom it's why I was so excited to know that you were writing it actually my first manuscript was a post-apocalyptic story you've talked about that yeah and I'm, yeah I'm kill to read it I'm kill to read it man <laughs> well I, I <laughs> grown a lot as a writer since then I hope <laughs> but uh but but talk about your kind of holy canon of post-apocalyptic books and 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 unpack maybe if you would what it is that that draws you to those books because I, I suspect your reason is probably pretty similar to mine yeah so I mean for starters I, I mean station 11 is sort of like for me at least that's kind of where it started in terms of I mean I'd read the stand and I'd read the road and I I, I love those books but station 11 started that was when I first started thinking about the intimate stories that you could tell against a, a much larger scope. Um, you know, not to say that that I mean, the road obviously is a very intimate story. The stand obviously is a is a much larger scope kind of story, um, and they both have elements of of each in them. But Station Eleven was a big turning point for me. Um, Severance by Ling Ma is is incredible. Um, the Book of M. Uh, they're, they're, they're uh, oh, the dog stars. <laughs> I mean, the list kind of goes, goes on and on, but what I, what I def definitely want to talk about is what it is that draws us to those stories, because I've recently kind of come up with the theory, and I wanted to definitely want to hear yours as well, but so like for me, uh, there's a definite difference between apocalyptic fiction and post-apocalyptic fiction, and uh, like a great example in my mind of apocalyptic fiction is um, Wanderers by Chuck Wendig, which is a brilliant book. I adored it. Um, I don't think of that as post-apocalyptic because it's primarily kind of, I mean, it, it is character driven, but it is about how it went down. What happened in this world? What was the apocalypse, right? And that's kind of what the story centers. Um, and, and so for me, I think what draws me to post-apocalyptic fiction is that it's not about how it went down. It's about who survived and 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 how are they navigating a new landscape? So that does, in my mind, that does two things. The first thing it does is it naturally and inherently shifts the focus of the story away from plot and onto character. It's not about what happened, it's about who it happened to. Um, and then the other thing that that does inherently is, again, not it's not to say that apocalyptic fiction is hopeless, it certainly is not, or that all post-apocalyptic fiction is hopeful, it certainly is not. But inherently, a post-apocalyptic story is dealing with survivors. It's people who already outlasted the apocalypse. So there's a natural shift toward a character, uh, an, a more intimate character study, and a more hopeful, hopeful story as well. Yeah, that's kind of the way I come at post-apocalyptic stories. To me, what they really do well is showing what remains of humanity when we strip away so many of the distractions, when we strip away so many of the trappings, what, what fire still burns? What still remains? What do we still have? And I find that these stories, what what's, tends to remain, what tends to stay standing, I think is sort of the, the best that humanity has to offer. It's, it's the love, it's the friendship, it's those <laughs> bonds, it's, it's that desire to, to learn and to explore and to go on when things seem hopeless. I, I find post-apocalyptic stories actually to be very hopeful um, because 
I, I find that when you tell stories where so much is stripped away, we're boiled down to kind of the, the very bare essence of, of what's best in humanity. And, and you helped me a lot with that because I think the flip side of that coin is then you, it's, it's almost like exactly what you're saying uh, but to both ends of the spectrum. Cause then you also have the sort of just like base kind of animal instincts that, that survivors in those stories often kind of swing toward. It's almost like there's no middle ground. You're either kind of just like the most empathetic, um, you know, like uh, thoughtful, art artistic, like hopeful driven person or, you know, you just want to burn it all down and kill everybody. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, but that was, a, you were a big help for me with that. You read, an, Jeff read an early draft of this book. And um, I mean, at one point you were kind of like, I think you need to add some more danger. There's like nobody in this book. There, there was one character, but it wasn't until near the end. There was no one else in the book to kind of hate <laughs> or, or to represent that sort of uh, more, yeah, base kind of animalistic side that chaotic anarchic side that would emerge exactly some people what i think about in in character and post-apocalyptic books there's a history podcast i really love called hardcore history and and the host will talk about um societies that have existed throughout human history and he'll talk about how certain societies are composed of people who are like ordinary people but more so so like all of the people who display love and loyalty and tenderness um, display those things more so in a post-apocalyptic post book. All of the people who are anar anarchic and, and chaotic and you know the kind of people who would storm the capital, um, when you strip away the structure of society and the system of in incentives and punishments that it provides, like you, you get a really kind of nasty person without those guardrails. So you, you get these really wonderful people and you get these really nasty people. And, and I find that, that I, really, uh, I really enjoy inhabiting that space where we get to see humanity and extremists that way. And I think it naturally raises the stakes too. I mean, if the, if the characters on your, on, in your story um, are already starting in, in pretty extreme places, um, you know, it kind of it kind of naturally does that. But also, so in the Electric Kingdom, most of the main characters were born. Um, they were either babies when the apocalypse happened, or they were born after it. So it's an sure. it was an interesting experience writing writing from their perspectives, um, because anything that they knew prior to their post apocalyptic life uh, was something that they'd either learned from their parents or that they'd read in books. Um, which to your point in terms of what, like when you strip it all down and what's still there, what's lasting. Um, one of the big, one of the big sort of North stars in the electric kingdom was art and books and the things that outlast the people who create them and how those things continue to shape and mold uh, people, even if there are a lot fewer people around. When you were writing the electric kingdom, did you ever think about <laughs> how much of human technology that you on your own could reproduce if you had to, like what we would just no more, like no more yeah. iPads, that's for sure. Yes. Uh, I mean, I couldn't even make it like a key, like a simple, just un forget technology, just like simple tools. I'm like I stone have, tools. I've got like, nothing. Yeah. I guess this rock is kind of sharp now. <laughs> yeah. I would have to find the things. Yeah. I'm not yeah. making any. Yeah. That's that's kind of what inspired my stab at a post-apocalyptic <clears throat> was just thinking about like how much humanity has to work as a team to provide all of this stuff that we've got because I on my own could reproduce right. so little. so little of human right. learning. Like I, <laughs> right. I could give you written right. language pretty good, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. but yeah. Uh, but that's about it. Yeah. So so the Electric Kingdom. Uh, the mechanism of the apocalypse, I, I guess we, we could say. Um, well, why don't, why don't you describe the mechanism of the apocalypse? Because uh, you're going to do it better than I do. And, and then I'm, I've, I've got a question about it. So um, essentially, you know, in writing the book, um, I really wanted the reader to be uncomfortable for long stretches, uh, mainly because the characters are uncomfortable. And there are things that the characters, like I said, they're mostly teens, or in one of their cases, he's 12. Um, they, they don't fully understand what happened. So I wanted to like leave enough breadcrumbs that the reader felt slightly satisfied, I guess, but I didn't want to explain everything. 
because the characters didn't know everything. And I, and I want, it was important to me that the reader be in that same place. So um, basically what you have are these sort of, well, murder hornets, I think, like you have these, um, <clears throat> they, I, actually in an earlier draft, they were just like rabid flies. And Jeff was reading one of those drafts and was like, yeah, I think you're going to need more than, and, and I was like, yeah, you're right. Well, what do you got? And you came at me with like a dissertation about the honeybee, <laughs> which I just, which was just so great. Um, and so I was able to do some research about like ways that they could have, it could have been a scientific experiment gone wrong, like a crossbreeding with honeybee sort of thing that um, led to these flies not only carrying a virus, but also having mutated into something murderous and terrifying. So you've got these swarms of flies uh, still in, in the world that are not only um, devouring people in midair, but, um, but also carrying or potentially still carrying a virus. Um, so I think that's the mechanism. And, and I love that mechanism uh, because it works on, on so many levels. It, it, it starts from, from the premise that there's colony collapse disorder among honeybees, right? Um, which is something that we have probably caused in some way, human beings. Um, it, it relates to how uh, interconnected our ecosystem is such that honeybee colony collapse would cause like our agricultural system to fail. And then what? Um, yeah, the domino but it, effect. But it also brings in an element of, of human hubris where every time we try to mess with nature, we end up creating another monster. It's, it's the most unique um, mechanism for apocalypse I've ever seen in a post-apocalyptic story. And it's my favorite. It is oh, so, thanks, it, for that reason, it, is, it works on so many levels. It's so creative. Well, thank you for helping me beef it up a little bit. I mean, I, I had the idea for swarms of flies that devour people in midair that carry a flu. Um, and you were, you helped me a lot kind of uh, give those flies a little more motivate character motivation. Well, good, good. I'm, uh, I am proud to have midwifed <laughs> any part of this novel. Um, but, but let me that so that brings me to the question I was going to ask you, we are speaking this way, because we are currently in the midst of a pandemic. I don't have like a really sharply defined question here, other than just to say, talk about how this yeah. book relates to the pandemic. And specifically, some of the people here uh, may not realize um, that, that this book could not have been a response to this pandemic, if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, so I think my primary answer to this question is that it's not a pandemic book. I think there is a pandemic in it, but as we talked about the difference before about the difference between apocalyptic fiction and post-apocalyptic fiction, I spend very little time discussing uh, the destruction of the world. It's really not, I mean, it's, it is mentioned certainly. I mean, it, it, there are some breadcrumbs as I mentioned earlier, but um, it's really not the focal point of the book. Um, so I'm grateful for that <laughs> because I know that there are books that were released and were worked on for years and years prior to 2020 happening that are about pandemics. Um, so, and I, um, yeah, I don't know how I would feel if I were one of those authors. Um, it's got to be a whole different level of complicated emotions because publishing is one of these things where it does, it takes years. I mean, um, when you, when you work years and years on a book and then you kind of find yourself in a moment where you start to see some parallels, um, it's very strange. Uh, right at the beginning of quarantine, I called my agent and I was like, I don't, because I mean, <clears throat> when quarantine started for us early March 2020, we already had a pub date picked. We'd already, P Penguin had picked February 2021. It was already in the books. Um, and and so, <clears throat> you know, and I'd been working for so long on the book and we were, we kind of all thought this is, that's the right time. And this all started to go down and I called my agent and he was, he was very nurturing and very, you know, he listened and he was like, let's, you know, let's just wait and see. We don't know what this thing's going to look like. We don't know what publishing is going to look like. There's no sense in making kind of a rash decision. Um, and I'm glad we did for a number of reasons, um, mainly because I do think the book provides hope. And I think that um, it, it does, you know, I, I kind of let myself go to, I mean, the book kind of goes to some dark places. And by the end of 2019, I kind of found myself um, having followed the characters into those places. I, I ended up in the hospital with some pretty serious medical issues. Um, and that was really when I learned, um, you know, you, you hear all the time, 
uh, and, I, and I very much accepted it as truth and believed it, um, the way that our mental and physical health is interconnected, but I had never experienced it firsthand until 2019. Um, and so uh, I had found myself kind of in a dark place and uh, it's not the book's fault, but, um, but certainly that was part of it was, you know, I'm a very type A kind of obsessive type. And when I, when I go after something, it's, I very much do it. I'm, I'm like hundred percent bought into it. And um, so I learned a lot about balance during that time and I was able to find the right help. Um, uh, and I'm so grateful to my family and, and also that I, this all happened in 2019 and not later on in 2020. So who knows what that would have looked like. Um, so that's all a very long winded answer, I think. But um, I do hope that the book provides hope and it did for me. And I was able to kind of write myself into, as, as my characters were, were walking toward hope, I kind of felt myself going there as well. So I hope that that's something the reader um, gets out of it as well. Well, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. I think it's a very hopeful book. What are some of the things that you found uh, hope or solace or grace in during this pandemic? Um, you know, the way people have just come together. I mean, we've we've just been so lucky in so many ways. I mean, my wife's job has been great. So she's worked from home. I mean, they had an office or they, technically they still do. No, no one goes there right now. Um, but she's been working from home since the beginning of, of March, 2020. My kid um, is, you know, virtual, any parent will tell you virtual school sucks, <laughs> but, but some kids do better with it than others. And um, we love our school. They've been terrific. And, and we have a kid who um, acclimated quickly and, and was able to kind of shift to, to um, I think it's not perfect, it's not great, but it's, it's going well. Which is which is a, another thing that I feel like is just really lucky, and, and also just having one. We have friends who have, um, and you can you can uh, relate to this, I'm sure. But like we have friends who have four kids, and they're they're older, and and it's and you talk to them, and it's like we don't we don't really know how it's going, <laughs> and and how could they really, you know? I mean, it's so we're just really in a, in a situation where we're so lucky and kind of um, isolated from. Um, but but I but I also so to answer your question, being grateful for the people who are in positions. That they're, where they're not, they don't have that luxury to, to stay at home and to have every, all the systems in place, you know? Um, so yeah, teachers are heroes, um, nurses, doctors, people working in hospitals, um, just seeing people kind of come together. Um, yeah. I, I feel like um, what, I've, what I've taken from this pandemic, what I've seen during this pandemic is <clears throat> what I love about post-apocalyptic books, which is seeing uh, a sort of heightened humanity. To me, it's really moving in this weird way to see uh, somebody walking up to a store and pulling a mask out of their pocket and putting it on. It's like this yeah. little, it's almost like a, it's like a salute. <clears throat> it's like flying a little flag that says, I care about other people. It's this little right. pathetic gesture <clears throat> that I just come to notice. And I, I love it. It makes me so happy to see. It makes me happy to see people in their homes. Like, to, to see you with, with the books you love uh, behind you, to see where people live, to see the place that they're comfortable. I love to see that. So there have, there have definitely been some, some parts about this pandemic that have kind of reaffirmed my faith in humanity in that way. And I, I completely agree with you about um, the, reaffirming for me the value of folks who have worked in positions that our society doesn't place great value on. You know, yeah. the grocery store workers, the fast food okay. workers, the, you know, the, the people who clean the hallways at hospitals, you know, these kind of positions, yeah. like, they're, they're, they're kind of the honeybees of our society, like, without them, we crumble, and there's just no, no society, it's, it's really a, a reminder of how tenuous things are, you know? Yeah, and, and in, in direct, as it directly relates to our professional world too. I mean, the, the independent booksellers um, and the, the manufacturers of books, a lot of the people don't think about these, where there are warehouses where, where books are made and people have to go to those places to make the, to make the books and they've continued to do that. And that's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's heroic in the sense that it, yeah, it's all, we're all in this together and there's this sense of that. But um, unfortunately there are, yeah, there's more sort of responsibility placed on the shoulders of certain people than on others. And I fully accept that 
almost none of that responsibility has been on my shoulders. So it's then it's like, okay, so what are ways that I can help? And, um, and that's a whole other, you know, conversation. Well, I, th I, I think storytellers are important. I think you're, you're fulfilling sure, yeah. a very important role, you know? Um, so let me, let, let, let me ask you this. You, you more than just about any other author I know, um, kind of bakes art into his books and bakes a love of art into his books. And maybe it's because I come to your books knowing how much you love the art that you love and how much it, it informs your work. Um, but I think more than any of your other books, the, the Electric Kingdom is kind of a love letter to art and, and the things we create and the things we leave behind. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about that and also the, the art that you were consuming when you were writing the Electric Kingdom and that informed your view of, of art as serving that role? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, uh, I think there's a natural inclination toward that because I was in a world, uh, an artistic world that had nothing to do with books for such a long time with music um, being the focus. And when you're creating music, I guess similar to books, but in a different way, it's so much of it is about your taste. And I'm not saying better taste than others, just different taste. It's a lot. Of, and then within that taste, kind of like narrowing down um, the things that, uh, all the things your influences, um, kind of the places that they lead you. And um, so, yeah, I think music for sure is, is part of it. Um, I, you know, I spent my first three books talking about the metaphorical ways that art and story can save us. And so um, I think in Electric Kingdom, there was there was an element of, of wanting to show a literal way uh, where art and stories save us. And I think um, we've, we've kind of touched on the books that they read and Kit, who's the 12 year old character is, he is an artist and he kind of dreams this painting and he paints it over and over and over again. And um, it kind of drives him and motivates him. But also Nico's father, I mean, <clears throat> the crux of the story really is, is or, an oral storytelling. Um, Nico, the main character has kind of been sent on this voyage which she she's not she's not sure uh, whether or not it's foolhardy her dad is is ailing and there is sort of an element of dementia and she's not really sure whether she believes him or not not that he would be maliciously lying but maybe that he doesn't know what he's talking about but she knows if she stays in this farmhouse she he is going to die and she herself may die and so he he tells her this this fantastic story about a mythical portal and says no it really exists and you have to go find it um, and so this actual, in a, in a sense, he is saving her in a story, which I just loved that idea that it would literally save Nico's life. Um, and so that was something that I definitely wanted, wanted to address. And then your second question about the stuff that I've, that I have been consuming, uh, I could go on and on, but what I am going to do is limit it to, to one. Um, in 2015, I walked into a, an alien movie and, and, uh, walked out a different person when it was over. Um, arrival, like, I, I mean, I could pinpoint that as the turning point in my life where I went from saying, I don't really like sci-fi <laughs> to I need more of this. Like, this is, I need more of these stories. And so, of course, it led me to the source material. I mean, Arrival in and of itself is a brilliant movie. Um, Eric Heiser, the screenwriter, made it his own, and it's so brilliant. The score by Joh Johan Johansson is so fantastic. It was the score that I wrote this book to, actually. Um, and then, but then it led me to the source material, which is Ted Chang's short stories. And that was where I really discovered um, the, the, the world that opens up when you, when you really look at what sci-fi can do. And I, and I, by no stretch of the imagination, uh, would ever compare myself to Ted Chang. But the idea that you can tell a story that is as intricate and complex and complicated and oftentimes impossible to understand uh, but do it in a way where you, as you're reading it, you believe that the author understands it and you're able to sort of kind of let Ted Chang take you by the hand and lead you through this very complicated story. And maybe you don't, maybe you're not connecting all the threads, but he does it in such a way that you believe he's connecting the threads. And so that was, I mean, that was definitely a, a huge, um, yeah, North Star for this book. I, I fully expect that there are going to be readers who don't understand everything that's happening. My hope is that they believe that I understand everything that's happening and they're able to enjoy it. 
Yeah, I just got to put in my own plug for Ted Chang. He is incredible. Good. And, oh, and the, so good. the story that Arrival is based on is like his fifth best short story. Yeah, it's not even his best one. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is only to say that his fifth best short story is better than uh, uh, what 99% of writers will ever write in their lives. Um, he writes one short story about, uh, he, he posits a scenario where somebody becomes through scientific experimentation, the smartest man on earth. And I have to say, he so convincingly writes <laughs> the mental processes of the smartest right. man on earth. It's like, yeah, man, you are really in the head of the smartest man on earth in a way that I very much <laughs> no. believe. Yeah, so let me, yeah let me he's, ask, he's so brilliant. Yeah. He's amazing. He's amazing. Let me ask you this. You talked about Kit painting the same painting over and over trying to get at something. Do you feel like that's what you're doing with your books? Painting the same painting over and over, trying to get at and something? And the hard hitting questions. <laughs> <laughs> because I do, I'll fully admit to it. I wanna know. And, you, you know, it's so funny because you and I have talked about things before where, um, I, cause I, we are so similar in so many ways and there are all these things I can point to in ways that were, that were similar. And, but one, ways, one of the ways that I know we're not similar is um, when we talk about intention behind our art. I, I've heard you eloquently and brilliantly and I love hearing you talk about why you do this, why you write young adult novels. I, and I love your answer for that. And mine couldn't be different, more, more different. Um, you, you, well, I mean, actually tell us, yeah, tell us why do you write YA, Jeff? <laughs> I hope I give the same answer that you're thinking of. Um, I, uh, well, I got into writing YA because I wanted to make art for young people. I mean, it was as simple as that. I was volunteering at a rock camp for teenagers and I wanted to make art for, for teenagers and I love coming of age stories. Uh, I love writing in that space where you're on the cusp of childhood and adulthood. I just think it's, it's really, really fascinating. And so with each of my books, I keep kind of approaching the same question in a different way. The question of what it means to lose something uh, at that age, what it means to, to fall in love, what it means to become, to learn who you are at that age. So I feel like, I feel like Kit, I feel like I'm painting the same painting mm -hmm. over and over, trying to find new shades of the painting, trying to get my hand around something. I always feel like I'm grabbing for a piece of fruit that's just out of my reach. So let, what's your answer? Well, I love, I just, I love that answer and I wish it were mine. I mean, the truth is I very, very rarely do I ever feel like I'm doing anything intentionally, <laughs> which sounds almost irresponsible. I mean, uh, my goal is to tell the best story I can tell. I've never sat down and thought, I'm going to write a book for teens. I've just never done it. It's never been, it's never been something I've thought. And um, I mean, I could easily say that, but I don't, I don't want to. That's not what it, that's, I'm thrilled to be writing for teens. I, I'm thrilled to be in this space. I love, uh, I mean, I love nothing more than to go on the road and talk to teen readers and it's just that's such a beautiful thing and like you said it's that age is uh, I, I love how under um underappreciated and how little respect teenagers get because they don't first of all they don't really care because they know that that everybody everybody else is wrong and I love seeing I love I love I feel like I know something that a lot of other people don't um which is that they deserve more respect than potentially any other age bracket <laughs> um and are so smart so I love doing what I do, but I don't ever feel like I've sat down and said, I'm going to do this on purpose. Um, so I guess, but to answer your question, um, which I've forgotten, which was, oh, oh, <clears throat> the same. Yeah. No, I, you know, I don't think that I mean to explore the same ideas or <clears throat> get at the same, paint the same painting every, every time, but Certainly, I've, I've, this is my fourth book, and I've recognized certain themes that, that keep coming back around. Um, found family is a big one, which is so strange to me. I have a great family. I love my family. I'm close to my family. We moved back. We moved. We left Nashville to come to Lexington because this is where our family is, and we love our family. And so. you left your found family of me, buddy. We could have been <laughs> brothers. Right. We, That's we right. were found family, and you're like, yes. see you later, found family. <laughs> later yeah. so yeah I don't know what that is about and in fact uh one of the few things I've, I have done intentionally when I sat down to write Noah Hypnotic my third novel I was saying this kid's gonna have family present because I hadn't done it in my first two and now in my fourth one I, I I haven't done it either I mean but but that's different because in in Electric Kingdom 
it's it's you know it's death and sickness that is separating them not a team just not really wanting anything to do with their family um so um anyway yeah i don't think i do it intentionally but but certainly found family and then the idea of home just like what it means to 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 find your your home i think is probably a theme in most of my books too yeah absolutely well, we've got some great questions from uh, from the crowd. So I'm going to go to some of the crowd questions. And guys, put your questions in chat. We're going to get through as many of them as we possibly can. So uh, Sheba, I'm guessing this is Sheba Karim, who is a Sheba. phenomenal YA author, by the way. Everybody read her books. Sheba Karim, K-A-R-I-M. Check out her book. She's amazing. Asks a question that I was going to ask you. Uh, it's a very good question. What was some of the weirdest research you did slash strangest questions you had to answer in building your post-apocalyptic world because you your world building is phenomenal i love it so oh, thank you uh and before i answer that question i have to plug shiva's book it comes out in may it's called the marvelous mirza girls I, actually i've only read it so i don't know if it's mirza or mirza shiva i apologize it is m-i-r-z-a the marvelous mirza girls or mirza girls you guys should all read it it's coming out in may it's brilliant um yes yeah, so the research process for this book was really actually it was really fun i i generally you know, I, we have a mutual friend, Ruta Sepetis, who, um, well, and based on the kinds of books that Ruta writes, all of them are brilliant. You should all check out Ruta Sepetis' books. She's also from Nashville. Um, she does um, a ton of research, like years of research before she ever writes a book. And it shows, and, and her books, I think, require that. Um, certainly when you read them, you're like, well, she knows everything about this, <laughs> this, you know, historical fiction. Um, I'm not like that. I don't, I don't love research that much. I, I love it as much as I need to love it. And it, and it varies book to book. But so for this book, um, my wife has a, has some family that lives in Maine and we've gone up to that country. <laughs> it is part of America, but the, con the country kind of open, land um a few times and uh well more than a few times and we've actually driven up there a couple of times as well and that land is just so beautiful and um uh, there was one trip we took where i was um her aunt and uncle have this house on top of a mountain and they have this deck that's just overlooking this view that's it's just remarkable um and i remember thinking then what would it be like if you know wingate was out in that and so that was an early kind of inspiration for the book um and then when it came time to write it i um I don't know how how well you you mostly write Tennessee um, space, but one hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So for me, when I'm writing a place that I haven't been, I start with Google Earth. That's not where you end it, but that's where I start, and I kind of zoom in on places and try to find like, okay, well, I knew that this, I knew there needed to be a city kind of near the end. I knew I wanted it to be in the woods of New England, so I kind of had to start there, zoomed out or whatever, and. Um, once I finally landed on Manchester and the Merrimack River, which is primary, the primary region where Nico is walking, um, we did one trip kind of early on just to get the lay of the land. And then I went back again um, once the manuscript was further along um, to sort of tighten things up. And I actually did walk, this is an, a long, another long-winded answer, but she would answer your question. Um, the second research trip I took to New Hampshire, I hiked Nico's journey along the Merrimack River into Manchester um, and it was just so fun and really informed the story. And I don't think I could have written this book had I not gone and walked much of it. Um, and actually there's a scene in the book that where they spend the night in a books a million. And the only entire reason that that scene exists is because when I was up there for research, I was walking the river and I saw, uh, it right around Concord or in Concord, um, there was like a strip mall, but it was facing the other way. And I was like, oh, I need to go see what these stores are so I can kind of casually mention a few of these abandoned, you know, post-apocalyptic stores. And I walked around and there was this giant BAM sign for Books A Million. And I was like, oh, this is too good. I can't, I can't skip this. So I actually adjusted the timeline of everything so they could spend the night um, in this abandoned bookstore. And it became like one of the most fun scenes to write. Um, so yeah, I would say that would be that would be the most interesting research I did for the book. There is a scene in my post-apocalyptic novel, which was never published, where they spend the night in a library. Oh, Jeff, yeah, Jeff. Oh, that's so fun, man. That's great. Yeah, same impulse, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Tracy asks, do you know how your book is going to end before you begin to write? Um, thank you, Tracy. I usually think I do. 
<laughs> I usually have sort of like a, a general idea. Um, this book is interesting and I don't, I really don't want to spoil anything. There is a, there's a character called the Deliverer who is omniscient and omnipresent sometimes it feels like. At one and, point, wasn't the, ti wasn't the working title of your book Nico and the Deliverer at one it point? It was. It was, yeah. I'd, well, for the longest time, I just called it Nico because I didn't have a title. And then when it came time to get really serious about the title, I was like, maybe I'll call it Nico and the Deliverer. But, but Kit's character had become way more primary than I ever meant for him to. And, and at, at, at a certain point, it became clear that this was kind of also his story. And so then it felt like I was, well, Nico and the Deliverer doesn't make, it, doesn't make any sense anymore. So, um, but yeah, so the Deliverer's character um, is really where this sort of the sci, I mean, it's a post-apocalyptic story, but the Deliverer adds this sort of sci-fi element to it. Um, and it's actually the only point of view that's written in first person. So even when you're reading it, it feels disruptive, um, which was intentional. Um, so I've forgotten the question again. It is. Oh, do I know uh, the, do I know the ending? Gonna... I think I know the ending and then inevitably it changes. Awesome. Um, Alicia asks, will the Electric Kingdom have a follow-up book? Thank you, Alicia. I, I won't say no, but I don't have, so I kind of have an idea the way, I don't, I hate to keep not talking about the ending, but there is um, something that happens at the very end of the book, like last page, very ending, that um, kind of opens up some new possibilities that I would, I would love to explore someday. Um, it kind of takes everything that, that you think you know and makes, it, makes you kind of go, oh, but maybe. And I might like to explore that maybe at some point, but um, I kind of want to write something a little, a little less, a little less <laughs> for my next book. I, would, I mean, um, I would love to do something a little lighter. Lighter than a uh, post-apocalyptic uh, story in which most yeah, of humanity is dead, <laughs> having been consumed by mutated bees and a, yes. a terrible illness. So uh, literally, I, literally anything else. <laughs> I think the only book that's not lighter is *The Road* by Cormac McCarthy. Right. Right. Yeah. No. <laughs> but and it, they literally. Well, I won't say that on. Yeah. No. If you've read *The Road*, you probably know if I'm going to talk about one awful scene. Oh, it's just the worst scene, but I don't want to say it out loud. I don't even know. I, I, I think I know which one you're talking it's, about. But it's something they have for dinner. Okay. Okay. I gotcha. I gotcha. Yep. <laughs> I gave my dad a copy of, uh, of, of The Road for Father's Day or for his birth. One of the two. Okay. So my dad's not a reader of fiction, right? In the past 20 years, he has read my novels and The Road by Cormac McCarthy. And his review of The Road was in totality, boy, they sure ended up spending a lot of time looking for food, didn't they? That's it. That's all he had to say. <laughs> Nothing about like fathers and sons, like oh, boy, they man. sure did spend a lot of time looking for food. I, lo I love great. my dad, That's but he's great. not a fiction guy. Some people yeah. just aren't fiction people. Yeah. Um, Zane asks, which of your book characters do you relate to most and let me uh, let me tack on uh, an, an addendum to this question, uh, which is something I wanted to ask you. How how did each one of these main characters develop? Where where did they come from? Um, so to answer Zane's question, I think I would want to relate to Kit's character the most. I think he's the most pure, um, and he is just a he's just this sweet innocent kid who just wants to make art and hug his mom. Um, and so like that would be what I would want. I think if I'm being really honest, I probably relate more to Nico's dad than any character in the book. His, his ultimate desire is to spare his, um, his child pain and suffering and ultimately even death itself. And that was sort of a, an ongoing exploration of mine while writing it. And um, probably more than any other book in terms of relating to the adults in the book, I would say Nico's dad um, in the Electric Kingdom. And then as far as the character development goes, gosh, um, I don't really know. I don't really know. They kind of, I, you know, I knew Nico was going to be doing a lot of walking in the woods. And I had a dog growing up. I had a family dog that I loved, uh, Adidas, who lived to be 18 years old. And um, I want, so I thought, okay, this could be my dog book. And, and I, that can be Nico's companion. So she's not just walking alone through the woods. Um, and so, and then I started thinking, okay, well, 
I want there to be some sense of not only did I want to lighten things up, but also for me, there's like a uh, the heavy, dark uh, bigness of things feels heavier and darker and bigger when you kind of juxtapose it with something that's light, more lighthearted. So kind of throughout the novel, Nico tells um, these awful dad jokes to her dog. Um, and the jokes are just horrible puns or they're just they're bad dad jokes. And um, so like that kind of killed a few birds with one stone um, in all of the ways that I just mentioned, but also kind of tying her, you could see her kind of still relating to her dad even after she'd left um left how left home so great uh amber asks have you considered writing a sequel to any of your other books the sequel question is always interesting for me and jeff i'm sure that you get this as well um i you know i i remember reading uh Lori hulse anderson's response to this um uh, for her novel Speak, I guess a lot of characters, a lot of readers had wanted her to write a, a sequel to Speak. And I remember, um, and this may not, this may not be her answer anymore, but at one point I remember reading a response that she had written to that, which was, um, she wouldn't say no, but she's not saying yes. And I think that's kind of where I am with, with all of my books. I don't, I would just need to have a really specific idea. Um, and I would need my character to prove to me that they needed to tell more story. And so far, that's not been the case. I've, I've, always, you, Jeff? I, I've always found with sequels, it's one of those things you say you want until you get it. And then you're like, mm -hmm. nah, I guess I didn't, I guess I didn't want this. I think it's better to want a sequel than to get a sequel. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. They're never as, they're, I won't say never, they're rarely as good as, um, yeah. So I, I hadn't even considered, you know, as a consumer of sequels, I, I'm rarely as satisfied as I hope to be. So I wonder if that's true as a creator of sequels. If the, yeah. if the person who made the sequel is less satisfied. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting. My, my process, the only way I can write a book is to pour everything I've got into the book in front of me. I can't, I don't right. save anything same. like emotionally. Yeah. It just, it all goes in there. And so. And yeah, that's interesting because I'm the exact same way. And then inevitably I end up feeling like when, whenever you get the question, so what's next? You're like, what do you mean what's next? I just gave you everything. <laughs> um, and it's, a, I mean, I ask it myself. It's, a, I'm not genuinely mad. I get the impulse, but when you've just finished it, it does, it feels like you just climbed a mountain and you reach the top and somebody's like, all right, now go climb, go climb that one. And you're like, I just did it. I just climbed it. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Krista asks, so oh, this is a good one. What songs would be on a soundtrack for Electric Kingdom? They wouldn't, they would almost entirely be instrumental. Um, I mentioned before the score for Arrival, pretty much anything by Johan Johansson, and I'm going to have to have you pronounce her name, Hildur Gu Guanadotir. Oh, oh I'm going to pronounce her name Did because of my <laughs> command over the Icelandic tongue. I don't know how to pronounce her name. It's Hildur, Hildur Guanadotir, I think. Uh, Guanadotir. She did the soundtrack for Chernobyl. Yes, and Joker, and probably my favorite one of hers is uh, for a TV show called Trapped, I think, which she did, I think, actually with Johan Johansson. The two of them oh, kind of wow. worked on that one together. It's gorgeous. Um, so yeah, Iceland anything... has like 450,000 people. Like and the population of the country. Musicians. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. like Nashville metro. It's like the less than the population of Lexington, and right. they produce so many amazing musicians. I also want to plug... Uh, I guess you would call him a band. He goes by Slow Meadow. Um, it's it's just a guy. And Jeff, I think you actually turned me on to him. Probably. Um, I, I I so yeah. A lot of a lot of Slow Meadow, Johan Johansson, and Hildur Guðnadóttir, um, for sure. Yep. Good deal. That sounds a lot like my soundtrack. Do we have other questions, folks? Now's your chance. You can ask David Arnold anything you want. I'm going to ask you a question that I asked you, and, and I, I, I'm excited to get to do this launch with you, but I'm sad that we don't get to do our launch tradition, which is go get pizza at DeSano. Yes. Oh, man. Like every time David and I do a launch together, we go to this pizza place in Nashville called DeSano that has the most amazing pizza. But by the time these launches get over, it's kind of like past the rush for DeSano, yeah. and it's always on a Tuesday night, which I guess is a slow uh, yeah. night. And it's a popular pizzeria, but every time Dave and I go there, it's just us in this like cavernous dining room. 
It's yeah. like a school cafeteria sized <laughs> dining room. And it's yeah. the two of us sitting at a picnic table in yeah. the middle, sharing a couple of pizzas. Talking it's the best pizza. Yeah, it's books. the best. It's the best pizza maybe I've ever had. Oh, good. Um, and I want to tell a quick story. The last is it the last time we were there or two times ago. I, I'm not going to get into the details of it, but Jeff and I were having a very um, uh, sort of um, vigorous conversation about God. And and literally the the time as we're having this conversation, there's like jazz music in the background. I think. And as we shift into this very serious kind of discussion um, about God, the hallelujah chorus starts playing. <laughs> do, you, do you remember yeah. that? Yeah. We was like dropped our pizzas and we were like, what is happening? There was no reason. This was not in the holiday season. There was zero reason yeah, yeah, for, was, for Handel's Messiah right, to be playing at right, that yeah, time in a crazy. pizzeria. Yeah, in the that, yeah. that was amazing, it's truly. Crazy. Um, Angela asks, you both write books that readers would bet were written by actual teens. How have you mastered the perfect YA voice? What a, what a huge compliment. That's such, yeah. a, that's such a big compliment. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, I, I'll speak for myself, which is just uh, actually, and I'm really curious to hear your answer for this, because I think this speaks to the question before about why we write and, and you having this sort of intention behind it and me just sort of arbitrarily like deciding I'm gonna write a story. Um, I think for me, it's just like for better or worse, that is so far that has been my most natural and most honest voice has been the sort of coming of age teen experience. Um, I remember my teen years viscerally. I mean, it's, it, it feels like I was there yesterday. Um, it's funny because my brother and I have this conversation all the time because he doesn't remember anything. And we had the same upbringing and, you know, but it's just, I don't, yeah, I don't know if that's part of it or not, but, um, but without meaning to, that's just what my, where my voice has, has been, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that it'll always be there. I have no idea. What about you, Jeff? So I have a really keen emotional memory for young adulthood. Like I remember it like it was yesterday. It's just, I can't remember. I can barely remember my own name from minute to minute, but I remember exactly what every minute of young adulthood was like for better or for worse. And now it's for better because I'm able to monetize all of those traumatic <laughs> memories, yeah. uh, which is nice. It's all but, about that money. Oh yeah, baby. Woo. Mercenaries. Uh, making it rain, baby. Yeah. Um, but, but I remember very keenly um, how I wanted to speak as a teenager. I wanted to speak with wit and energy and, and life and vigor. I loved the way people talked on television. I loved shows like, like Cheers and Northern Exposure and, and comedies. I loved comedy. I loved the way people talked in comedies. And, and these weren't teenagers, you know, voices I was idolizing. These were like people, middle-aged people, but that's what teenagers do. They, they grow up consuming pop culture that's created by people our age. They filter it out. They add their own slang to it to make it their own, which I do not try to reproduce. I think that's a full, hang on a sec. I got to let this dog out of here. Just While he's gone, what I, one thing I will say is um, I think like whenever, whenever, I think my favorite criticism of, uh, sorry. So I was trying to, I had some filler here. I was going to, I was going to hop in and, We're and just going to riff, do a little. My story. favorite, yeah. My, my favorite criticism uh, is always, teens don't talk like this or teens don't think like this ah. I'm like do you you don't you don't really know any teens then do you yeah. like clearly you don't you don't like know what you're you talking didn't about. you didn't say witty stuff when you were <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. you were hanging yeah. out with the right people. Not, you haven't spent time with teens have you so I, yeah. I never try to reproduce teen slang I think that's a fool's errand I think by definition by the time it percolates up to to us to where the the social strata we inhabit it's done, it's over with, and they've moved on. So you don't try to reproduce the slang exactly. You try to reproduce the energy of the way you talked as a teenager. And so you just make a lot of choices in your writing to give it voice. Teenagers like to speak with a voice. So your writing has to have a voice. You cannot substitute your attempts to reproduce sl teen slang for a voice when you write YA. It won't work. I don't know, Jeff. I think this conversation's lit AF. <laughs> And you're looking very drip, I might add. I, 
I've never, that's the first time I've ever heard that. I have no idea what that <laughs> definitely means. didn't use it in the right way. <laughs> I definitely didn't use it in the right way. And now this is, I, I think this is going on Facebook. So I'm sure that, uh, you know, I'll be I, I, I think one of the most powerful things you can do as when approaching the teenage audience is to both care about them deeply and to not care about them deeply, like not care what they think of you. Just, right. just be like, listen, you yeah. have a curfew. I don't. That automatically makes me <laughs> yeah. cooler than you. Yeah. I'm yeah. not going to worry too much. <laughs> and I'm just going to create this art for you because yeah. I do love you. I'm just not scared of you. It's really right, important right. not to be scared of teenagers. All yeah. right. I'm going to ask you one more question, David. It's a question I asked you two years ago. I want to know if your answers changed. Okay. Um, you okay. cannot answer this question in a self-effacing or self-deprecating manner. You have to confront it straight on you get a pass for egotism you get a pass for for being a braggart i am asking you to do this tell the people assembled here what is your favorite thing about david arnold books what do you love most <laughs> about david arnold's writing um i wear my emotions on my sleeve as a person and i think my books do the same thing and for that reason, you kind of know going in that there's going to be a large group of people that can't stand it <laughs> because that's true of people. <laughs> um, and so, but yeah, I think my, I think my books are, they're, they're fairly emotional and um, I don't know, like I, I do, I love, um, I love dialogue. I love finding space for characters to talk to each other. Um, so there's going to be quite a bit of that, but I also love, I've, and I've grown to love more, you know, this is my first book in third person or primarily in third person. And I don't know that I'll ever go back. I mean, I love that space. Uh, I feel like I get a lot more room to explore language in ways that, um, I haven't been able to do in my first three books, just based on the point of view. Um, so Yeah. Did, was that a, was that an appropriate answer? A good That's answer? a great answer. I'm I'm going to tell you what I love most about David Arnold books. Oh, thanks. <laughs> there, there are some writers out there who are tremendously interesting, brilliant people, and then you read their books, and it's like none of that's on the page. Mm -hmm. And you are a tremendously interesting, brilliant person whose books are somehow smarter than you. <laughs> like I read your books, and like they are somehow smarter than than you. Your considerable intelligence. I'm like, how on earth is somebody who can turn a phrase like this friends with me? What is well, he doing? <laughs> Jeff, I have to say, first of all, you are a brilliant writer and a brilliant individual. But also, I will say, I recognize this in myself that whenever. I am no good at verbal arguments. And I know this is something that you did for a living for a long time and are very good at. This is partly why I post very, I have sort of my own personal um, like political uh, social media rule is don't always, this is for me, don't always, what is it? Don't always say something, don't never say anything. So like I try to say something sometimes and put a lot of effort and work and energy into that, into writing and constructing my thought, because I could never stand up in a room and have, an, have a verbal argument. I just end up bleh. So writing is kind of how I work stuff out. And I think that, I think that's a reflection of, of what you're saying. Cause I think you're, you're, you're right. I mean, there are times when I'm writing something and, and I'll, and I'll even think, oh, this, cause it's rare where you write something like, oh yes, this is great. I mean, usually it's like, oh, this is awful. But when you do have those moments, those rare moments where it's like, this is so great, I can even recognize there's no way I would ever be able to stand up in a room and just say this. Um, so writing is, I think, how I uh, not just see the world, but kind of interpret my own um, inner workings. So. Well, my friend, you are very, very, very good at it. We are so happy to have another book of yours in the world. It is a blessing to all of us. Uh, we will wait patiently as long as it takes. For your next one, we hope it's not too long. I think I speak for all of us. We hope it's not too long that we have to wait uh, because we do love your books and we love you, David. Thank Jeff, you. Jeff, so I love you. And yeah, thanks so much for joining me here. I mean, this is such a weird, it's such a weird thing, which you're going to experience most likely. Um, it's August in the wildlife. Yeah, August. Yeah. And sadly, I probably it'll be probably like August. I'll be so it's a very strange thing, but it makes it it makes it fun when you can do it with friends. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. So. That's right. 
Everybody, thank you so much for coming by the Electric Kingdom. Uh, read it, love it, read it again, give it to all your friends, tell them to read it, tell them to buy it, read it, read it again. And uh, good That's night, it. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> love you guys. Love you, Jeff. Bye bye. See you, bud.